Greetings to all our assembled members and guests, and welcome to today's program. I'm Deborah Cafaro, Chairman and CEO of Ventas and Chair of the Economic Club of Chicago. I'm honored to welcome our featured speaker, Brian Cornell, Chairman and CEO of Target. I'm also delighted to be joined by Mary Dillon, CEO of Ulta Beauty, and the incoming Chair of the Club, who will moderate our discussion. We meet today after having postponed our program with Brian last Tuesday out of respect for the then imminent jury verdict in the George Floyd case. We appreciate that Mary and Brian were committed to rescheduling quickly so we can all be here together today. Now, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce our moderator, Mary Dillon. Named one of Fortune Magazine's most powerful women, Mary has over 35 years experience leading consumer-driven brands across a diverse range of industries. In her eight years as CEO at Ulta Beauty, Mary developed and nurtured the company's winning, inclusive culture and drove significant business growth, having more than tripled Ulta's market capitalization to more than 18 billion. Mary and Target have a long and multifaceted history, and she is uniquely situated to lead today's discussion. Mary served as a member of the Target board from 2007 to 2013, and recently Alta and Target announced a groundbreaking partnership that will result in the opening of over 100 Alta stores within a store at Target locations with additional locations planned for the future. Mary, before I hand the program over to you, I want to personally congratulate you on your appointment as the next chair of the club. I'm confident that your special combination of a globally respected profile coupled with your love of Chicago will accelerate the club's success and we look forward to renewed economic growth and in-person activities. Over to you, Mary. Debbie, thank you so much. Thank you. You know, I know you know this. I am just honored to take on the role of the chair of the Economic Club of Chicago. And you've already been so helpful to me as I, we start to make this transition. I'm grateful to you and everybody else who served in the role before you to really help build this organization to be at the heart of the Chicago business community. And David, I really look forward to working with you and your team to keep this vibrant sense of community that the club creates going strong. So let me just say, I am thrilled to be here today with my friend, Brian Cornell, and I believe this is gonna be a fantastic program. After a decade of transformation, it's hard to predict what the future of the retail industry will look like, but we can tell you one thing, do not bet against Target with Brian Cornell at the helm. Brian took the role on in 2014 with more than 30 years of experience in consumer and retail, just the leadership in the background that the company needed at that time following challenges like the 2013 data breach, as well as a quickly evolving retail industry. One of Brian's biggest and boldest decisions came in 2017 when Brian made what some thought was a big gamble. Despite the brick and mortar is dead narrative that was echoing throughout Wall Street, I know I could hear it, Brian and his, his leadership team presented a strategic plan that would double down on brick and mortar stores and use those stores as the hub for expanding its e-commerce business. Critics were in no short supply when the plan was announced, but the naysayers were silenced in 2018 when Target revealed its best results in a decade. So of course, what has been the biggest challenge for so many of us and all business leaders, of course, has been came in 2020 with the COVID-19 pandemic. But once again, Target surpassed expectations of retail companies by today in today's market by weathering the pandemic, not only weathering, but increasing sales by 20% last year to $92.4 billion, while also launching in-store partnerships like one with Apple, and of course, I'm happy to say with Ulta Beauty. Today, Target employs more than 350,000 team members and has more than 1,900 stores. They're proud to have operated um, locations in Chicago since 1993, and today they employ more than 16,000 team members across the metro market with more local jobs on the way, which I'm sure Brian will be happy to talk about with us today. 
Target was one of the first major retailers to speak out after the death of George Floyd, pledging $10 million in donations to social justice nonprofits and investing in the Minneapolis community. Now, recently, Target continued its commitment to racial equity when it announced a pledge to spend more than $2 billion with Black-owned businesses by the end of 2025. Now, personally, Brian and I crossed paths back in our PepsiCo days, but I really got to know him through the Retail Industry Leaders Association shortly after I became the, the CEO at Ulta Beauty and I joined the board. So Brian was the chair and he successfully voluntold me to become his vice chair so that later I could succeed him in chair as the chair in 2020 and, and what a year for all of us in retail. So I'm really happy that I, I could do that. But seriously, Brian's become a friend. I've really grown to admire his leadership his courage, his true inclusivity, and his commitment to family, his wife, Martha, his kids, and his grandkids. So how has Brian managed to lead through all of this, these challenges? I'm thrilled to discuss that today with Brian Cornell. So welcome to the Economic Club of Chicago, Brian. Well, Mary, it's an honor to be here. Congratulations on your new appointment. And I really appreciate how quickly the club was able to reschedule this meeting. So I'm really looking forward to our time together today and our discussion. Thank you so much, and thank you for your flexibility. In fact, you know, I thought maybe we should start there. You know, this is all on our, this is on everybody's minds. It's so top of mind as the verdict was coming in about an hour before we were going to do our, our event, the Chauvin trial. You know, listen, you're headquartered in Minneapolis. We face challenges in Chicago. We face challenges across the country uh, in terms of policing and race, and, and this continues to happen. So, you know, I know that Target and you have been historically leaders in the space of diversity, inclusion, and equity. But maybe you could start with just kind of painting a picture for us is how you led your team through the crisis uh, when this happened, both your team and the city. Well, Mary, we've had a commitment to diversity and equity and inclusion for a number of years now. We've had a DNI office in place for over 15 years. So it's been core to who we are at Target. But Certainly over the last year, we've all spent more time listening and learning, educating ourselves, and determining what actions we need to take to be true leaders in this space and to continue to make sure we were role models for not only the organization, but our industry and other business leaders in America. So going back to that day last May on the 25th, when we saw the murder of George Floyd, I would start by saying, Mary, this is how personal it was for me, recognizing it, it happened only blocks from our headquarters. And my first reaction watching that on TV was that that could have been one of my target team members. So it's been a action point for us ever since to make sure that we did play a leadership role. We quickly gathered our team and determined what steps we were going to take. We put together a special committee focused on racial equity, taking action and driving change. We call it our REACH committee. And we've been very focused on four key pillars. What we can do for our Black team members, how we advance business with our Black vendor partners, the role we can play in communities across the country, and how we use our voice on a national level to, as we impact civic discussions and policy. So we've been very focused on taking the right action. You and I can spend more time talking about some of the things that we've done. You highlighted some of those in the introduction. But if I think about last week, I think we all recognize that the eyes of America and the eyes of the world were on Minneapolis waiting for that verdict. And as we sat and listened last week, I think for so many of us, we saw that verdict as a sign of progress, a sign of accountability, but also a recognition that the work is just starting. And there's much more work that we have to do, much more work that we have to lead going forward to continue to make sure that we're making improvements and closing these racial equity gaps that exist all around the country. Right. And Brian, you know, I um, admire how you've been a leading voice throughout this for all of us in retail. You know, we employ so many people, as you know, and we have so many guests coming through our stores. So I think we have to set the right tone. And, and you, you've really done that. 
And, you know, um, well, I, I'd like to maybe just kind of bring it up a little bit and talk also about Target, you know, just your, your, your company, because, you know, you, I think this notion of equity and inclusion, the George Floyd murder was a catalyst for all of us in business to start to, to address this even more aggressively. But in the workplace, you know, you've long been committed to diversity and inclusion. And in fact, I, you've got an amazing leadership team. Many of them I know pretty well. And I've always been impressed. And in fact, in February, you announced a host of leadership changes and that included primarily women and people of color. So I thought it'd be kind of interesting for the audience here to hear your perspective on diversity and inclusion in the workplace at Fort Target. Well, Mary, I'd start with a personal belief that to be a successful company today, your teams, your workforce has to reflect the consumer, the customer you serve. So you talked about the introduction. We're close to a $93 billion company today with over 350,000 team members. I'm really proud to be able to say that of our 1,900 stores, over half are led by female store directors. Over a third are led by people of color. I look at my own personal leadership team at Target. One half are women, 25% are people of color. Even at the board level, a third of our board are women and 50% are people of color. So we've tried to make sure that we role model the type of organization we want, where we're championing diversity and inclusion and giving our teams opportunities to prosper and grow and make sure that we're committed throughout every aspect of our organization to opening up doors for diverse team members to become future leaders and officers in our company. Yes, you know, I think one of the things that I've always been struck by with Target is just how far out ahead I feel like you've been understanding the demographics evol evolution of our country. Because I remember years ago, and obviously you're doing a lot to commit to black owned businesses right now. And in addition, I just remember years ago being in a store somewhere in the country, probably in the Southwest, that was completely targeted the Latinx consumer. I remember seeing some advertising a few years ago that you guys were doing that was so on spot. You know, and this is the fastest growing segment of the population in the U.S. So I'm just not asking you a question. I'm just saying as a retailer, I admire because it's exactly what you said. You need to understand, sir, we need to represent the people in our country and we need to provide great career opportunities as well. And, and I think Target's setting a real tone there. So that's yeah, awesome. And I, I appreciate those comments, but we've also recognized that there is still more for us to do. I go back to some of the commitments we made as part of our REACH committee, and you highlighted some, but when we released a report last year that provided transparency into the shape of our organization, we did recognize that we had to do more to advance opportunities for black team members. And we made a very bold commitment to say that over the next few years, at every level of our organization, we want to increase black representation by 20%. While we partner with a number of black vendors today, we made a commitment as you outlined to between now and 2025, ensure we're doing over $2 billion of business with black vendors and service providers. So we continue to recognize we've got to raise the bar. We've got to do more. We've been working with the historical black colleges to provide a scholar program for thousands of students to make sure they have a chance to advance their education. And I'm proud to say we partnered with Ken Frazier, the former chairman CEO of Merck and his One Ken program to make sure that together with Ken and other companies, we're creating a million jobs for black Americans who don't have a college degree. So while I think we've We've started off in a strong position. We recognize there's more we can do. And we've set very specific goals, challenging goals, to make sure that we continue to play a leadership role in this space. Well, and that's where I think our business audience here can continue to learn from you as a leader. And I'm not just trying to butter you up, but it is about being public with your goals and setting targets and being accountable. So. I think it's amazing. And, and it actually, if you indulge me, I'd like to talk about you as a leader and as a person for a minute, because I think this is a good pivot to something I wanted to share with folks here who, who are listening. But you know, earlier today, I was speaking to some Ultra Beauty Associates about some of the leadership lessons that I've learned and in things that I maybe, I don't want to say I took for granted, but 
belief in, in, in leveraging our empathy for others and our humility and respect, you know, um, those for me ended up being super more important than ever in the last year. But just as you were answering these, I think you talked about thinking about George Floyd through the lens of it could have been one of your associates. And you talked about, we're not all the way there yet. That's humility to me. And it, it just makes me think about, you know, I, I, at one point I asked Brian, I didn't know what the answer was gonna be, but I asked him a question and, you know, sometimes we all have unconscious bias and we all look at people and make assumptions about their lived experience based on their demographics, whatever, right? And so I asked Brian, I'm so curious, like how is it that you have such deep connection to this concept of inclusivity? And it's not, it's not like, uh, fake. It's real, right? It's not just words. It's real. So I'm like, Brian, what brought you to that point in your life? And I asked you that question, and I'm glad I did. So I wondered if you could share that with folks here today. Yeah. So Mary, if I go back in time, you know, I grew up in Queens, New York, which is even today, one of the most diverse parts of America. I grew up with a single mom who played a really important role in my life. I went to Catholic schools and you know, up until I was probably a teenager, I didn't realize that there were anything other than nuns that uh, taught school and classrooms. And I happened to work for some great companies that put a great premium on diversity and inclusion. And you and I share, obviously, a history with PepsiCo. I've also had the opportunity to live and work all around the world. Uh, my family and I have lived in Asia and Europe. I've spent quite a bit of time working in Latin America. In fact, I think over the years, I've managed over 60 different countries. So it gave me a great respect for diversity and cultural diversity and growing up the way I did, it was natural to have enormous respect for female leaders and growing up in a diverse community, you know, that felt quite natural for me. So it's been something that's been personally important to me throughout my career, but perhaps never more important than it has been over the last 13 or 14 months where I recognize that it's time to take it to another level. And that as CEOs, we have to be the company's head of diversity and inclusion. We have to be the role models that drive change. And our voice is important. And we've got to make sure that we represent our company principles, our values, our company purpose on the issues that are important to our teams. Well, and I can attest to the fact that this is genuine in you and it's applauded by many. So, so thank you for sharing that. This might be a good time to pivot to your career a little bit more if, if you don't mind. So, um, hey, in doing research about you, I learned some things, Brian. You know, you, you've had so many amazing roles with some of the country's best known retailers, right? Safeway, Michael, Sam's Club. You've been on boards, you're on the board of Yum Brands. You've been the chair, you're the chair been that, you've been on that board for some number of years. Also learned you were, two, you were CNN's 2019 CEO of the year. Did not know that, that's pretty cool. Now I know that, uh, but I'll tell you what I've loved is just your journey, your career, how you've done so many different kinds of things. And I'm just curious if you could walk us through a little bit, you know, what that's been like and kind of how that, what are some of the highlights and how did that lead you to where you are now with Target and, and the success that you've had at Target? Well, Mary, I'll go back to being a student on the campus at UCLA. And I'm a big UCLA fan. I'm a big John Wooden fan. I've got Wooden books behind me right now. And I can tell you, I worked my way through college coaching high school football and working in retail. And back then, I had no idea what a CEO was. And I had no expectations that I'd ever become one. I actually thought early in my college days, I'd end up being a teacher and a coach, but I pivoted into the business space. And I guess I've been a lifelong really student now of consumers and customers of strategy. And I had the great opportunity to work with some amazing companies and have mentors that really shaped my career and opened up doors and gave me unique opportunities early in my career. So, you and I have that in common as well. We both had this unique career in both consumer packaged goods where I spent over 23 years and in retail. But I think for both of us, it's given us that focus on consumers and customers, understanding the importance of capabilities, but probably the importance of great teams. And for me, the importance of culture. And you talked about some of the target highlights over the last couple of years. Well, 
strategy has been important and capabilities have been critical and having the right team in place is obviously essential. I think one of the things that we've learned over the last year is the importance of culture. And we talk a lot about the target culture really being about a culture of care and growth and winning together. And I saw that culture in action over the last year, like perhaps never before, as our teams woke up every day thinking about how we took care of each other, how we created a safe working environment for our teams and our guests, and how we showed the agility and flexibility and resilience to prosper in this environment. So, you know, back on those campus days at UCLA, I would have never imagined that I'd have the privilege of running an amazing company like Target. And I've just been fortunate that I've had great experiences and coaches and mentors over the years that prepared me for what I'm doing today. That's really cool. And I think that's uh, why we get along so well. It's something we have in common, you know, uh, working in retail, waitressing, I've done all sorts of jobs, putting myself through college. and. And I really think that, you know, and also when you work in different places, Brian, I think you also get to see what you like and what you don't like about a, about various experiences, bosses, cultures. And it's truly an honor as a CEO to be able to create or build on a culture in a way that you think it, that, you know, is consistent with your values. And I go back to empathy and respect and humility. So I think that shows well, and I think it, it, it must have helped in 2020 for you guys to have such a strong culture, no, no doubt. Well, I think the way you and I grew up, you know, I think you never forget where you came from. I think it grounds you in a sense of humility. And I think it does, does make you a more accessible leader. And I do think as we sit here today, that accessibility, the ability to recognize, you know, the challenges that are taking place all around us. You've already used the word, but we talk a lot about empathy and listening and helping our teams build resilience during these challenging times. And, you know, I wish I could say, you know, COVID was behind us, but we know it's not. And the right. social and racial challenges are still in front of us. So I think those attributes are going to be critically important for leaders for years to come. Well said. So let's get into the heart of the Target business, right? This is a, a, a lot of everybody loves Target and everybody loves what you've done and your team have, have done there. So. You know, you've been leading the company over seven years. You defied, as I said in the introduction, the retail is dead narrative. It actually sounds laughable in retrospect now. Uh, you doubled down. You made a huge investment. I remember when that was announced, $7 billion in stores and technology. And of course, you know, I mean, I, through 2020, I, I'm, I'm sure you're very happy that you had been aggressive in that front, but leading up to that as well. So maybe paint a picture for us about what's Target doing right? How are you competing again? You have some formidable competitors uh, out there right? And you, you're you large and at scale, but you're also nimble. So maybe you can help us understand how, how that all comes together. Yeah. So Mary, I might go back to 2017. You've talked about it a couple of times. And that was a point in time where we revealed a very new strategy for the company. We talked about investing over $7 billion in physical stores, in remodeling our existing stores, in building new small formats, in investing in our brand and also investing a billion dollars in our team in higher wages in training and development we made a commitment all the way back in 2017 to a starting minimum wage of 15 dollars and when i made that announcement and when we walked through that strategy and that commitment back in 2017 there were a lot of naysayers in fact many people didn't actually expect that target would be here today but those investments have proved incredibly beneficial during the pandemic. Our focus on using our stores as the center of everything we do, both for physical shopping, but also for fulfillment. Our 1900 stores operate like mini distribution centers where we pick and prep and pack product and ship it out the back door with FedEx or UPS, or more and more have our guests utilize our order pickup services or pull into one of our parking lots. And with a matter of minutes, we put that order in the trunk. We have over 300,000 personal shoppers through a company called Ship that will come to Target and other retailers and shop for you and bring it right to your home. So we didn't build a strategy based on the pandemic, but it certainly has served us well. And it's allowed us to differentiate versus many of our competitors. 
So that strategy of using our stores at a time when most people said stores are gonna go away, that proved to be critically important during the pandemic where somewhat to my surprise, Mary, despite the last year where many Americans were staying home to stay safe, physical stores still represented over 80% of all the retail dollars that were spent in America. So I think one of the things you and I both agree on is, while digital is gonna play a really important role going forward, there's still a place for stores and Americans still love to shop in great physical environments like Ulta Beauty and Target. And I don't think those trends are gonna change. Yeah, I mean, that's actually probably a pretty good pivot to the uh, next question I wanna ask you is that, what do you then see in the broader retail landscape as we look forward? kind of building on what you just said. Mary, I think we're gonna to continue to see winners and losers, the bifurcation that's been taking place for years in the market. I think those companies that have been very consumer focused, that have been investing in a physical experience, a great and easy digital experience, investing in their brands, and importantly, investing in their teams, they're gonna to continue to thrive. So I think we're gonna to continue to see not only retail consolidation, but I think coming out of the pandemic, consumers will continue to consolidate the number of places where they shop. I think safety is going to be important for years to come and having a safe and trusted shopping environment will be critically important. But I think stores will matter. And I think we're gonna see this combination of physical and digital come together. But for most consumers who shop Target or shop Ulta Beauty, they're not thinking about whether today they're going to shop in a physical or a digital environment. They're just shopping at Target. And some days they're going to be in our stores. Other days they'll be in our parking lots. And some days they'll just want us to bring it right to their doorstep. And that ease and convenience and flexibility, I think it's going to be critically important in both of our businesses for many years yeah. to come. I couldn't agree more. Um, and, you know, um, another aspect of our business that I know is on every business person's mind is the back to work for the corporate headquarters, right? So obviously in retail, our stores have been open for us, not the whole time, right? But we're back open. Our distribution centers have been open, uh, but corporate headquarter work has changed. And the big question is sort of how's everybody going to go back to work and what's the hybrid model? I know you've made some announcements about this, and I'd love to hear more about how you see the future of your sort of headquarter work for Target. Well, Mary, it's actually something we spend time on every day. And we've spent a lot of time serving our teams, talking to other companies, trying to understand what does the future look like? And I would tell you, we've evolved our thinking from originally talking about back to office. We then started talking about the future of work. Today, I'm much more focused on how do we make sure we are a preferred employer for years to come? And what are the attributes we need to provide? And I do think the future is going to be one of more flexible working, where sometimes you're in the office, other days you can work from home, but I think the office environment will change. And I think while the office is still gonna be critically important for collaboration and connection and culture, I think the future of the physical work environment is gonna change. And I think it's going to need to change to meet the needs of tomorrow's team member at Target who might be looking for more flexibility and may not be looking to drive to the office each and every day, but still values that connection with their team and recognizes that there's going to be days when they want to be together physically and other days where they could be highly productive working remotely. So I think technology is going to evolve. I think space will evolve. And I think the routines that you and I have had for most of our career are likely going to change as we think about a different, more progressive work environment in the future. Yeah, and I, you know, I'm happy to hear you say that. We're um, we haven't announced our all of our plans yet, but we're in a similar mindset at Ulta Beauty. And you know, throughout my personal career, I have when I was having my children and building my career, I created uh, and innovated some some you know things 30 years ago, a job sharing program when I was a brand manager. I had one role where I was telecommuting 
I guess that's like this, but it was on a phone, one day a week at home and four days in the office. And so I, and all of those things only made me more committed and more productive and more happy. And so I think as we move forward out of the pandemic, I hope we can see that the model of hybrid or some modicum of flexibility can really work. And it's a two-way street, right? The, the, uh, the associate or the team member has to you know, do their part and then the company can do its part. So I'm sure we'll continue to learn and compare notes as we go. I'm happy to hear that. Um, so not to be all about Ulta, but let's come, let's talk about retail partnerships because I couldn't miss this opportunity to do this. Um, I'm really excited about the Ulta Beauty Inside Target that's, you know, we're launching later this year. Um, you know, you have other great partnerships too. I, listen, when you announced the Apple partnership, I think you're building on a relationship there. And I, of course, we both know you have a long-term Starbucks partnership. I feel we're in great company and I'm excited about it. So maybe talk a little bit about how you think about these partnerships overall. Well, first, Mary, you know, I am so excited about our partnership with Ulta Beauty. And similar to our partnerships with Starbucks or Disney or Apple, for me, it all starts with the reaction we get from the consumer and our guests. And in every case, you know, we've built these partnerships because our guests have told us, these are brands that they would absolutely love to see at Target. So when we thought about expanding our focus on beauty, which is a critically important category at Target, when we talked to the guests, as Mary, you know so well, over 90% said we would love to see Ulta Beauty inside of a Target store. So the partnerships have been all about you know, the guests telling us these are brands that they'd love to see curated and available at Target in a physical store and from a digital standpoint. But then the other thing that's important to us and important to me is shared values. And when we look at this partnership and with everyone who's joining us today, I will tell you, you know, Mary Dillon is a friend, but she's also an executive that I've got enormous respect for. And I have for many years now. I knew that our companies had shared values and principles. And as we started to think about this partnership and our teams got to know each other, that was only amplified. So that combination of a consumer and guest voice and partners that have common values and principles and a culture that will come together and work together well, those are really important ingredients for a successful partnership. And again, I can't think about a better partnership than the one we've just formed. Yeah, and I'm thrilled how the teams are working together. And for all of you out there who might try this and, and, and shop, you know, it's a great opportunity for us. I mean, for Ulta Beauty, it's happened to so many millions of people that shop at Target that maybe haven't been to an Ulta Beauty. For the Target guests to get a chance to try some brands and experiences that are, they don't have today, curated and really experiential and fun. And we think it's just gonna make all boats rise in a way that, you know, for both of us, this is coming from a position of strength it's about playing offense, you know, and that's that's what I think is just really cool. There's my big football analogy of the day. Okay, that's as good as it's going to get from me now, so I'll stop <laughs> on sports. Okay, so let's pivot to talk about Chicago for a little bit, okay? My hometown. Um, you got, I mean, Target obviously has a great retail presence. Um, you know, I read that you debuted it here in 1993. It feels like it was a lot longer ago than that. So maybe that fact is wrong, but it feels like you've been here forever. So can you talk a little bit more about how you see Target growing in Chicago? Well, Mary, we've been in Chicago since 1993. It's a really important market for us. Uh, in the greater Chicago land market, we've got 86 stores, 20 in the downtown area. Since 2016, we've opened up 12 new stores. And we're also really excited about the fact that we're opening up this summer a new distribution center in Little Village where we'll add 2,000 new jobs and they're great paying jobs. They're gonna start at a wage of $18 an hour. So really excited about the future expansion there. It's also a market where you know, we've been giving back for years. And you know, just this year alone, we've given back over $2 million. And our teams, even during the pandemic, volunteered over 2,000 hours. So that element of being really present in the community, making a difference is really important to us. And there's some great stories. Uh, just the other week, I had a chance to talk to one of our executive team leaders, uh, Brandon Allen, who's on the Gold Coast. And 
he took a very proactive approach to making sure we were impacting the local community. In addition to working at Target, he serves on the board of the Southside YMCA and talked to us about opportunities to work with the Y to make a difference locally. He's part of a other group that's really involved in you know, my block and my city and my hood. And how do we work and help mentor young children in those areas? So we really leverage our teams to activate our brand and our giving in the local community. And that's what I think makes Target such a special company. Going all the way back to when we opened the doors and Mary, you were on our board, but you go back to 1962 and the founding Dayton family always believing that, you know, if we can help communities thrive, then it's going to help everyone, including our business. And you know, the fact that we still give back 5% of our pre-tax profits each and every year and give them back locally, to me, is one of the things that for Target team members, they're most proud of. So when I think about the work that Brandon's done and other leaders in the market, finding opportunities for us to make a difference neighborhood by neighborhood, those are kind of the special touches that I think connect us in the community and hopefully make us a great partner and a great neighbor in Chicago for years and years to come. Yeah, and I'm really glad you mentioned the 5% giving back. I feel like that's a fact that many people maybe don't know about Target. It's been something that the company has done for a long time. I think you guys were you invented ESG in some ways, right? Uh, before this became super fashionable. Uh, but it's the right thing to do. Also, uh, the Little Village uh, Distribution Center, that is great news. You're absolutely right. That's a lot of jobs and it's really exciting. And oh, by the way, I can walk to my local, my small format target right from my house. It's like a, only about a five minute walk and I'm there a lot. So I just want you to know that. <laughs> I appreciate but thank that. You. This is exciting to see more to come. So, all right. Um, Let's do a little lightning round. Let's just learn a little more about Brian Cornell for fun because then we have to turn it over to David and we'll get some uh, questions from folks that are attending. But let's just learn a little bit more, okay? So short questions, short answers, we'll see where it goes. Uh, Brian, what's the bravest thing you've ever done? Wow, Mary, I wish I could tell you I was a skydiver or did something uh, adventurous like that. If I think about things just from a business standpoint, you might remember a few years ago when there was a big corporate tax discussion taking place. I was asked to represent the retail industry and testify in front of Congress for three hours and 45 minutes on something called the border adjustment tax. And I can tell you, I spent weeks preparing for that, a lot of sleepless nights, and actually sitting in that chair and looking at all of these members of the Ways and Means Committee getting ready to ask me questions, it was terrifying. And it was probably for me personally, something I will always remember. And I hope I never have to do it again. That sounds like a root canal meets a spinal tap. I'm sure you realize you probably knew more than almost everybody else in the room by the time you got in that room. But that's, that's a great story. I remember when you did that. So if you unexpectedly find 15 minutes in your day, what would you do with that? And not testify in front of Congress? Yeah, Mary, I'm gonna call my wife, Martha, or my son, JC, or my daughter, Megan, and see how my family's doing, check in on my grandkids, and use those moments to make sure I'm staying connected to my family. It's too short of a time for a workout. What's your best life hack? You know, if I need to get away, if I can close the door on a Saturday afternoon and turn on the TV and get a couple of hours watching UCLA football or basketball, that's a great way for me to just kind of step away from all the things that you and I have to do each and every day. That sounds like a lifeline. Hey, Brian, what's something that maybe a lot of people don't know about you? Well, you probably know this, but most people don't. Obviously, I'm a big believer in fitness. I'm a somewhat addicted to Orange Theory. Where I was going to bring it up, but I thought I'd, I'd wait for you to bring it I, up. <laughs> I go two, three, four times a week. So it's something that people probably don't know or don't expect, but it's again, my way of recharging and unplugging. I love that. And how about something you cannot do? Mm. Mary, I grew up in Queens, New York. Swimming was not part of my childhood. So I can wander around in the pool pretty well, but 
I would probably say swimming is something I don't do very well. Okay, that is good to know. We are not gonna throw you in the deep end. That would not be nice. Last one, what's the best piece of advice you've ever been given? You know, I'll go back to something that John Wooden, the famous UCLA coach talked about. And it's really about how do you make every day the best it can be? And make sure that you're giving back and having an impact and touching people and driving some sort of result each and every day. And I really do approach every day trying to say, all right, how do I maximize this day? Bring my best to work, bring my best to my family, bring, bring my best to the team and try to make a little bit of difference each and every day. Well, I think you've made this a great day for the Economic Club of Chicago and for everybody who's been able to join and listen. I learned some great things. It's been fun, Brian. So uh, can I turn it over to David now? David is the president and CEO of the Economic Club of Chicago, and he's going to join the conversation and take some questions for us. Great. Mary, thanks, thanks Mary. so much for doing such a terrific job uh, interviewing Brian. And Brian, as Mary said, we're going to cut to some member questions. Uh, the first from member Brenda Wolf, which kind of dovetails with Mary's question about a Target's presence in Chicago. As you know, there have been several reports about the possibility of Target moving into the former Macy's space on Water Tower Place. I was wondering if you can enlighten the audience if there are any plans that you'd like to announce or moving forward, and then respond to what has been some, uh, some quasi-criticism that having a Target on Michigan Avenue might change the complexion of you know, what has always been a luxury shopping district. Yeah. Well, nothing to announce today, but we're actively looking at new opportunities to invest in the city. And it's a critically important market. And we think we've got an opportunity to continue to expand and serve different neighborhoods across Chicago. I would tell you that you know, over the last few years, we've now opened up well over a hundred new stores in a number of different geographies, including in some marquee locations. And whether it's work we've done in Santa Barbara or in Cape Cod, great historical sites now that we're entering in downtown Pittsburgh or in Charleston, we're really respectful of how we bring our brand to life and make sure that we respect the best of the history of some of the new locations and bring the vibrancy of a new target. So we'll continue to look for great new locations in Chicago. We are very committed to expanding and investing in the city, but no announcements today. But trust me, every time we enter a new location, you think about our store on State Street, you know, it's one of my favorite places to visit because it's retained all of the great history of that building with a little bit of target flair and smile that I think we bring to consumers each and every time they shop that location. Uh, let's step back and take a look at the macro retail environment. You mentioned earlier that today, 90% uh, of uh, retail transactions still uh, take place in a physical location. If we were to look 10 years ahead, do you think that uh, percentage will be the same, much lower? Uh, give us a perspective into the future and what you think that mix will be. I think one of the things that we've learned over the last few years is it's not going to be an either or. I think the future is going to be driven by the and word, A and D. I think consumers for years and years to come are going to blend both shopping physically in a store and taking advantage of the ease and convenience that comes along with shopping digitally. I mean, we made a commitment a number of years ago to become America's easiest place to shop. During the pandemic, we raised the bar one step higher and said, we also want to be America's safest place to shop. And I think that blend of a great in-store experience, one that's safe but inspiring, one that builds trust with the consumer and the ease and convenience of just pulling into one of our parking lots um, on a Thursday afternoon when a couple of kids are asleep in the back seat and having a Target team member put your order in the trunk. I think those are gonna be habits that will continue for years to come. So I don't know if it's gonna be 80, 20 or 75, 25, but I think it's going to be this unique blend of physical shopping and taking advantage of the ease and convenience of digital. And those are going to continue to blur together for millions of Americans each and every week. 
And as there is this growing transition to online retailing, how will the physical space and the physical experience of shopping uh, change? I know, for instance, you're doing more uh, uh, stores within a store. Uh, how else will it change, not just for Target, but for the industry as a whole? You know, I think from a Target standpoint, we'll continue to be a curator and make sure that we've got the right assortment category by category for our guests. I think for successful retailers, you're gonna to have to be very close to understanding what the consumer's looking for, what they're expecting from your brand, how you bring that to life physically in stores, bring both the ease, but also the inspiration that consumers are looking for. So that's why we're so excited about elevating the Apple presence in our store. We're bringing Disney to our stores that will delight millions of young children on a Saturday morning. Or the response that we've received when we talked about bringing Ulta Beauty into Target. So those great partnerships that provide the consumer and the Target guests you know, that excitement of saying, I really physically, I wanna be there because there's something new, there's something exciting, and there's great brands that I wanna browse on Sunday morning and want the opportunity to be able to order digitally and have it brought right to your home. So I think successful retailers are gonna be great students of the consumer. They're gonna understand their customer. They're gonna have great capabilities to manage assortment and fulfillment. They're going to have to curate great brands. But I think equally important, you're going to continue to have to provide great customer service. And I think one of the things that we continue to hear from consumers is even in this new age of digital, that human touch is really still important. We like someone who can be there to answer our questions or provide that little bit of help, or just simply ask, you know, did you find everything you need and are you having a good day? So I think human touch is something that's gonna be part of successful retailers for years and years to come. So we've been talking about the evolution of the shopping experience and the retail industry. So over time, we've seen the industry change from mom and pop to department store to malls, big boxes, and then uh, online shopping. What do you see as the future or the next iteration of retail? Well, I both believe, but I also hope it's going to be a combination of you know, larger companies like Target and great small businesses that continue to thrive across the country. And I think for our economy, we have to recognize just how important small businesses are. The important role that retail plays with over 42 million jobs tied to retail in America. Some of those jobs are at Target. Many of those jobs are at small retailers that are in every city across the country. So I both believe, but I also hope it's gonna be a combination of both. Both retailers like Target who have larger scale, but also those local retailers that understand the needs of their neighborhood and their community. And I think retail will always be a blend of both. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about Target's expansion strategy. Uh, you alluded uh, earlier, or Mary did, to um, doing maybe some smaller format stores in downtown areas. You mentioned you have 1,900 stores now. If you were to look in the future, do you have plans to open X number of stores per year over the next several years? And if so, how will they manifest themselves as full-size full target stores, smaller ones located in downtown areas, located in suburbs? Maybe give us a little flavor of what Target's physical expansion plans look like. Sure. We would expect to open up 30 to 40 new stores for, you know, for the foreseeable future. You know, as we've looked over the last few years, going back to really 2014 and 2015, we recognized that we had to be more flexible in our format. We couldn't find acres and acres to build a full-size target store with 140,000 square feet. Sometimes we had to learn how to operate in 30 or 40,000 square feet and become much more flexible and curate assortment for that local neighborhood and that local consumer. So over the last few years, we've been opening up in great downtown settings and many stores, 12 now that we've opened up in Chicago. We've also made a big commitment to college campuses and we've opened up stores on college campuses across the country. So some of those stores are gonna be smaller. Some will look a lot more like a full-size store 
it'll be 70 or 80,000 square feet based on the opportunities we're seeing in catchments across the country. But we're committing to expanding. We're gonna to continue to grow. We'll also continue to remodel our stores. And this year we'll remodel about 150 stores and we'll probably ramp back up to well over 200 next year. So investing in improving the physical experience, enhancing that experience, opening up new stores, and then again, partnerships like we have with Ulta Beauty, bringing those kind of surprise and delight moments to our target guests and really making sure we're meeting all their needs. So Brian, you alluded earlier to Target's own um, future you know, work at home, work in the office plans. Uh, a question from our questions committee was, what is the future of some of the locations you're putting in downtown uh, areas if there's the possibility there will be actually fewer people who will be working in traditional office buildings and center city locations? I think those downtown stores are still going to play a vitally important role. And a number of the notes that I've been receiving during the pandemic from guests who live in downtown Chicago or in Boston or New York, there are notes that say, you know, Target, thank you for having your store open, for giving me access to all of the categories that I shop whether it's food and beverage or household essentials, a place to pick up their medication, apparel items and things that they need for their home, the ability to shop for electronics and home office supplies. Those local neighborhood stores have played such an important role servicing that local neighborhood. And no, they haven't seen the traffic that they did in the past when their office buildings adjacent to them were closed, but they play a critically important role. And we think we've got a really important role to play in the future in urban settings across the country. Question from member uh, Durandal Beverly. He says, at what point do you see uh, virtual reality, augmented reality uh, manifesting itself in a retail environment? Is it something that Target's looking at? You know, we're constantly looking at new innovation, but I'll go back to something I said earlier, that the human touch is still really important um, for physical retailers. And despite the fact that digital plays an important role and we've continued to enhance our digital experience, your ability now to shop and actually envision how something might look in your home, you know, what it might look like um, on your bookshelf or in your dining room is really important with augmented reality. But in the physical store environment, we found that consumers still like that personal touch they like to be able to interact with the product. They like to interact with our team. So we'll carefully think about the role that technology plays. It's been really important as we think about safety. And we try to make sure that there are more opportunities to shop and check out in a contactless environment. But we recognize that consumers still enjoy shopping and interacting with product in a physical environment. And I don't see that changing anytime soon. Okay. Uh Somewhat related question, uh, how is Target tracking the behavior of Gen Z consumers and how is it adapting in order to, you know, adjust to that consumer behavior? We spend a tremendous amount of time talking to consumers, talking to the different cohorts, understanding their different needs and trying to anticipate both their needs and their wants. And the, the Gen Z consumer is a critically important consumer for us as we think about the impact they're going to have in the future. We're tracking them both from a consumer and shopping standpoint, but also that's an important voice as we think about the future of work and what this new flexible work environment looks like. So that's a voice that we're spending a lot of time listening to, both from a shopping standpoint, but also as we think about how we're going to operate from a target headquarters standpoint. Great. Question from Christy. Uh... Pascavan, who's a member, she said, um, with the number of employees that Target has, what are you doing to retrain or upskill uh, people in your workforce as the work environment becomes more technology and data driven? It goes back to one of the commitments we made in 2017. Uh, and at that point, I talked about investing over a billion dollars in our team, in increased wages, but in training and development. And it's something that is critically important to us. 
I'll go back to bringing Ulta Beauty to life inside of a Target store. We're gonna spend hours and hours training those team members to be experts in the beauty space, to be experts in serving the guests who's coming to us to interact with Ulta Beauty and their assortment. So whether it's in technology, whether it's how we manage our front end of our stores, how we manage fulfillment, we're investing in training and development constantly with our team to upsize their skills, to make sure they're ready to serve in this new environment that is constantly changing in retail. So the training development aspect is critically important to us to be the preferred employer that we are in the retail business. One final question, and this is from member Don McNeil, and he's wondering uh, what uh, the possibilities or what will be the importance of celebrity driven brands or brands sponsored by influencers like YouTube, an example. So is that something you're monitoring and something that uh, Target is um, ready to respond to? Well, I think influencers today play a really important role. And we know that our guests are very connected from a social standpoint. So you know, when we have influencers talking about our brand, you know, that's critically important to shaping behavior and opinion. But one of the things that for me is an aspect that I enjoy so much about being here at Target is those stories that are posted almost every day. You know, those life moments where you know, a little girl is in a Target store with her mom and getting ready for a special event and you know, picking out that dress for Easter Sunday or mom's getting ready for that birthday party at home. And those Target life moments are so important. And a lot of times, you know, I get to wake up in the morning and there's something posted and it's really personal. And it's someone who had a great experience shopping in our stores, finding great product at an amazing value. And they're posting and talking about what an impact it had on their friends, on their family, on their children. So those moments for me are just, you know, so delightful because it just shows how we're connecting with so many families. You know, and I talk about our culture, I'll leave with kind of our focus on purpose. And it's a rally point for our company. And we try to wake up every day thinking about how we help all the families, the 30 million families who shop our stores every day, discover that little bit of joy in everyday life. And sometimes it's just those little things that we can do those unique products that they find in our stores, the smile on a little boy or little girl's face that really brings our purpose to life. And that's something that you know, for all of us makes working at Target just so special to recognize that we can bring that little touch of joy to all the families who shop our stores each and every day and just try to help them find you know, those little special moments that delight them in their lives. Brian, can't thank you enough for spending time with our Economic Club members and their guests today and for giving us an inside look into how uh, Target has adapted to both the physical and online environment. So thank you again for being with us again today. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Have a great day.